Well, good morning. Welcome to OPCC. Welcome to those of you joining online. We're glad you're with us as well. If you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 21. That's a long ways from chapter 1 where we started. But we're nearing the end, and um, I've learned a lot, been encouraged, uh, and continue to be encouraged. Probably, this is probably one of the most fun chapters of the book of Revelation to preach. So that's good. It's a lot better than I'm talking about some of them that I've had to deal with. I don't know if you ever feel like um, you get uh, frustrated about how things go. You ever feel that way? Like you're like, man, I wish, I wish this would have worked out a little bit differently. I was actually talking to somebody yesterday about this and, and said, you know, hey, uh, they had told me they were frustrated with themselves. I said, you know, I get frustrated with myself all the time. There are always times in my life um, something going on somewhere where I'm like, dang it, I wish that would have been a little different, or why didn't I do this, or I could have done better there, or I could have fixed this where it wouldn't have done that. I knew better. You know what I'm talking about? We have those feelings often um, that happen for us. And so um, it's interesting as we come to this chapter of the book of Revelation, because I think it's designed and was written to help us in those moments. As a matter of fact, the book of Revelation is, is written to help us in our most dark days when things might get the most frustrating. And some of the things that I described and was referring to are a little bit um, lighter, if you will. They're not as heavy. But then there are things that happen that could be heavy, uh, things such as sickness, um, grief over losing a loved one, um, things that are much more alarming, losing a job, a shift in your financial position, and just a little bit of uncertainty about how things are going to work out there, all kinds of different things that we experience in life that can really um, disturb us. And in the early church, uh, the New Testament believers during the time of the writing of Revelation, they were going through some extreme persecution. I mean, so they were being persecuted for believing in Jesus. And some of them, it was all about because they wanted, um, they wanted, there was pagan views that were in place that, that maybe some people in uh, the ruling authorities wanted them to pay tribute to these uh, pagan gods, and they, they were being challenged to compromise their faith and do things in order to survive economically, um, in order to do business with other people. They had to compromise different things, and if they didn't, they were ostracized, and they couldn't do business, and they were kicked out of these um, guilds, if you will, that was sort of, you needed to be in with this network in order to be able to be profitable in your business. Then there were others that were um, uh, persecuted because they, 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 it was more religious in their observance. Maybe it was the Jewish people who were persecuting the early believers for claiming that Jesus was the Messiah. And so they were ostracized from the Jewish community. So a lot of different stuff going on and, and even got to the point where there was emperor worship happening that if you didn't worship the emperor, it could cost you your life. <clears throat> and the word is, calls us to worship only Jesus. And so Christians sometimes were giving their lives um, for the sake of their faith in Christ. And so the book of Revelation is a vision that God receives or John receives from God. Um, Jesus encounters John on the island of Patmos, gives him the book of Revelation, and it's to help the church in times like that. And it's to help the church, uh, believers throughout the ages and in whatever time period we're living in, even today, as we go through weird experiences, as we go through things that bring about heartache, we go through loss um, then we could look at the book of Revelation and find a lot of hope. And so it's, in, it's fascinating um, that Apocalypse, as we've titled this series, sort of has this connotation of, man, it's really, really bad. But for a believer in Christ, it is God's vision and God's plan for how he will work out in humanity, in time, his objective for all of creation. And so it actually is good news in the sense of if you know the Lord, if you're walking with the Lord, it is good news was to approach the book of Revelation. And, and Apocalypse um, is actually a good thing because it speaks of where we're headed and, and what the Lord ultimately has in place for us. Now, if you don't know the Lord, Apocalypse does have a negative connotation. 
But as we start today to really get our minds wrapped around some things that I think will help you, certainly it's probably one of the most important principles that I follow that help me. On a, it, it just helps me on a daily basis. Since I've been following the Lord um, over the last three decades, really been sold out to the Lord, man, and have gone through a lot of ups and downs in my life. This helps me during the downs. This helps me during the difficult days is to have this, this mindset that I'm going to teach you about that the Word shares with us today. And the first thing I want to kind of for us to see is that Christianity, or the Bible, if you will, starts with a garden and ends with a city. God creates the first human beings. He places them in a garden, and he says, look, be fruitful, multiply, and subdue the earth. Rule over the earth. Here, here is the garden I've created for you. Um, I want you to manage it. I want you to be the steward over it. I want you to be the steward of the animal kingdom and all the, that, it, that has existed in my creation. And I want you to multiply, and, and that's my commission for you. And so the Lord's intent in the beginning, when everything was perfect, before the fall happened, was for man to be active in a garden and I think ultimately to end up with a city. Now we, he didn't put him in the garden and say, don't do anything. He put him in there and said, look, here's work. And so work in and of itself is not bad. Um, work is a good thing. It's by the sweat of our bow, brow and when the world became cursed and work became really, really difficult. It used to be um, before the fall and its original design, work was just something that we did not so much for provision, we just did because of enjoyment. We, we, we like to do things. Isn't it fascinating um, how we like to take old things and fix them? And some people say, I don't like to do that. I just like to buy new things. Same thing. You throw an old thing away and get a new thing, it's really just a shortcut to taking an old thing and fixing it. Uh, we like to take um, in your home, you know, you go and you um, repaint the walls. And you're like, man, it's, it looks new in here. And people like to get old cars and restore them, take something old and make it new. Where is that coming from? I mean, it's everywhere. People take old furniture and make it new. Um, and so sometimes now it's really popular to go find old clothes and make them look fresh and new. Never got into that one. Won't be going there. Uh, some of you, though, you're great at it. <laughs> Just keep, uh, but that's not my deal. <laughs> and so, like, where is that? It's, it's part of the nature of the Lord. Like, he, he, he likes to make things new, and we're going to see that. And so the Lord is in the process of transforming this garden into, this, into a city. So when we get to the book of Revelation, it talks about a city, man, it's over and over. And it talks and refers to the city of Babylon, which is the, the city of sin, the city of wickedness. All that is evil is associated with Babylon and the city of God. And so when we get to chapter 21, we have this contrast between the city of Babylon and the city of God, and we've seen that the city of Babylon has been judged, and that's what last week was all about. But we know that if God is in the process of transforming the garden into a city, a city needs citizens. And as believers, that's what we are. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, man, when he invites me into his kingdom, I become a citizen of the city of God. And my life has been transformed. The scripture says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. He's restored me, okay? Like, just like we like to restore things, God has just restored a human being. And I think it's part of um, what is known as the Imago Dei. The image of God is in us, okay? And we, we like to be like God, even if we don't realize we like to be like God. And so God makes all things new, and Jesus came to redeem people and populate the city. <laughs> like, and so in the old covenant, in the beginning of creation, be fruitful, multiply, physically multiply, and subdue the earth. Under the new covenant, under Jesus, he says, what? He says, go and be fruitful and make disciples, multiply, and populate the city. That's what discipleship is about. We make disciples that make disciples that make disciples, and the church started doing that over 2,000 years ago. And so we're to be reproducing on a spiritual level citizens for the city of God. 
And Jesus said it this way, right before his departure. John chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Now the disciples are like, we don't know the way. He said, hey, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and nobody can come to the Father but by me. That's what the text goes on to say. And so Jesus is building a city, okay? That's what this whole thing is about. You come to church, it's about Jesus building a city. And the church is just a way to say people who are true believers and and belong to the church is a way to say, men, we're citizens of the city of God. We belong to Jesus' city. And since creation, since all the way back in creation, after the fall, he said to the woman and the man, he said that that you will the, the evil will bruise your heel but you will crush its head, and the seed of the woman will be how I fulfill this. And so it will be somebody, it was a prophecy of that, that the Messiah would come through the um, uh, repopulating the earth, that somewhere down the line, salvation was going to come. And we know that it did in the form of Jesus Christ. One of you choir members left a stick on the stage. All right. I was getting under my shoe there. And so, and so, uh, so Jesus, in the midst of that, even very back at the fall, has said, look, you need to be looking forward. And we know that he comes to Abraham. God comes to Abraham, and he visits Abraham, and he gives him the vision. He calls him to leave what was familiar to himself, his home, and to go make his home in the promised land that he didn't possess yet. He just said, I'm going to give you this land. You go live here. And this is God coming and speaking to man and telling, me, telling him to do this. And this is how the nation of Israel um, is, is, is formed, is through this um, visit by God to Abraham. And so Abraham moves to the promised land, and he lives like a foreigner. It says he's a stranger. The writer of Hebrews talks about it, and it says of Abraham... That and him, and as well as the rest of the patriarchs, that they were looking for a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And so we're called to look for this city. It goes on to say in chapter 11 of Hebrews, verses 13 through 16, listen to this. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So throughout the Bible, we have these people that are talking about, man, they're they're looking forward to the city of God, that God is the architect. He's the one that is building the city, and they're not being, they're not getting focused on the city that they can see physically. They're walking by faith and not by sight. The apostle Paul goes on to share with us, he says in Colossians chapter 3, on how to live. Chapter 3, verse 1, he says, since then... You have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. It's like, man, set your mind on things above. Like, your, your life is hidden in Christ, and you've got to think about that. You've got to set your mind on it. And what does that mean to set your mind on something? Well, Jesus, when he went back to Jerusalem, they wanted to kill him in Jerusalem because he had started this movement, and they were intimidated by it. And at one point, he says, we're going back to Jerusalem, and the apostles like, were like, man, we don't want to go back to Jerusalem. 
Last time we were there, they tried to kill you. Jesus, they were going to throw you off a cliff. Are you sure about this? He said, and John says, from one moment, at one point, that Jesus set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. And what Jesus did is he got his mind. He knew he was going back to Jerusalem and be, be crucified. He said, well, why is there the determination for Jesus to do that? Because he had his mind set on the city he was building, and the cross was necessary in order to populate the city, the citizens, to take it beyond the initial covenant to ape from Abraham out to the Gentile world, and the gospel to be open, and, and the, it to travel, and, and citizens from all over the world to populate his city. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, continuing the idea, says this in verse 17, talking about when going, referring back to that, man, we go through these, these difficulties in life. Things get hard. We get frustrated. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You say, so Paul is saying, men, we, we go through these things, these, these momentary and light troubles are achieving something in eternal glory that outweighs all the troubles, all the frustrations that we could ever face on this side of eternity. And so what do we do? We, we fix our eyes once again on what is unseen. Not on what is seen, but what is unseen, because we know that what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. So what are we to set our eyes on? What are we looking for? That's what Revelation is all about. So now we turn to our text, Revelation chapter 21. You're like, wait, we're not even in the text, or we got a whole chapter. Don't worry, the Chiefs played last night. we got plenty of time. All right, so let's go through chapter 21 in light of setting all that up and saying, what, what, is, what, is, what is it that we are to set our minds on, our eyes on? And this is what John sees. Now, he's just seen the, all of the judgment. Remember last week, the, the judgment of the false prophet and the, and the judgment of the beast and the judgment of the dragon. They have been cast into the lake of fire, and so we're entering like... A, 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 a new part of the vision. Like this is all the city of Babylon has been judged. The city of Babylon eternally is populated. Just like the city of God is populated. They're judged and they're, they're placed away from the city of God. And then John sees this. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Now, some people believe that this is a brand new earth that is created and a brand new heaven. Some people believe that it is a renewal of the existing earth and heaven, that God will remake uh, and recreate the heavens and the earth. And so it, it, it could go either way, but it's new nonetheless. And he says, I saw, so, so again, John sees a new heaven and a new earth, and then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Now, I've done a lot of weddings over the years. And we always come to this part, man. We, we come and we play the music, and man, the groomsmen come out. And then we, the songs, maybe like the, the bridesmaids, and they come down with the groomsmen, I guess, escorted, and they take their place, and I'm there, and the groom is with me. And he's waiting, and all of the you know, flower girl and the ring bearer comes down, and she's doing her thing. And then after that, the music changes every time. Every time. And the doors close, and the people get up. And all of a sudden, the music shifts to something different, and the doors open. And everybody's like, sees the bride. And she comes. Thank you for that emphasis. <laughs> and, she, and she comes down, and like many people are in awe, oh, the bride. And this is what she, it's a picture of this. That's why, we, that's why we do that. That's why we're so captivated by it. Jesus says, man, I, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. 
So God's city, man, is now coming down. The city that has been populated throughout time. He says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be be his people, and God himself will be with them and, and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of water of life. And those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. And then he makes reference to those who are part of the city of Babylon. He says, but the cowardly the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And you say, well, there's, I'm, not, I'm not sexually immoral, I'm not, a, I'm not vile, I'm not a murderer. But don't, like, cowardly, what does that mean? That means everyone who's too afraid to believe in Jesus they're cowardly. They're unbelieving. They're linked with all these other immoral people. It's like, man, whoa. They're not citizens of the city of God. They're citizens of the city of Babylon. And then it says, one of the angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and he said to me. Now, this is fascinating because if you go back a couple of chapters, one of these same angels comes and and says to John, come and I will show you. Come and follow me. I will show you the harlot, the prostitute, the, the, the woman who rides on the scarlet beast. And he takes him out to the desert, the wilderness, to show him, this woman that is everything that, that typifies or symbolizes everything that is evil. And now he says to him the same thing. So he's contrasting the city of Babylon with the city of God. And he says um, to this one, he says, come and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And this is the consummation of the marriage when it all comes together. And so as, as the bride of Christ, we look forward to the wedding day. And this is it. And it says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. What's fascinating, you study the Bible, that there are several attempts. Again, the, the city of Babylon tries to build in their city a tower going up to the heavens. And we like to build high things. We build these skyscrapers. There's always something about who can build the tallest building in the world doesn't matter because you never get up to heaven. Heaven has to come down. And that's what's happening. The city comes down to the new heaven and the new earth. It's coming down out of heaven from God and it's shown with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates yeah, I thought, I thought heaven only had just two burly gates. No, there's 12. You know, all this imagery that we have is awful. It's just awful. If this imagery of a guy up in the clouds and Peter's outside the pearly gates and he's there and he's like, hey, why should I let you in? Nothing like that is in here. 12 gates, 12 angels. And so they says that they're It's shown with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel. The 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates, and on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Why? Well, it's symbolic of the fact that all of the Old Testament saints will be that that knew God. Not every person who was alive during the Old Testament period, but the Old Testament saints, the people who were actually drank from the same spiritual rock that the writer of Hebrews talks about, was Christ. It was Christ in the Old Testament. Those people, the 12 tribes of Israel that represent those people who actually knew God, they will be there. Their names are written on on these gates. But there were, and it says there were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. Why? Because it's telling us, man, symbolically, people from all over the world, all four points of the compass will be part of the city of God. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. 
And on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So so now we get to the New Testament saints. They're actually the foundation. They came after the Old Testament saints, but it's the foundation. And this, again, gives us a comprehension of before the creation of the world, the Lamb of God was slain, man. Everything is built on the good news of the gospel of Jesus. It says, the angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. And the city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. And he measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. And the angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubic cubits thick. And the wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. And the foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. And then it goes out to to name all of these stones. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, man. Twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each gate was made of a single pearl. So you get this symbology, man, and it it reminds me of that. Why are the gates made of the pearl? Remember the parable that Jesus taught? He says, the kingdom of God is like a man who found a pearl of great price. And what did he do? He went and sold everything that he had to purchase that one pearl because it was the most valuable thing he'd ever seen. And so he's saying, like, Jesus is the most valuable thing that has ever impacted the world. He's a pearl of great price. What does he say of himself? I am, he says, well, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He says, we don't know how to, he says, you know the way. He says, we don't know the way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. I'm the gate by which the sheep enter. Okay, and so he is the pearl of great price. And the great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. And it's laid out as a cube, as wide and long as it is high. Some people estimate it's about 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. I don't think that's what's significant about it. What's significant about it is it's laid out in this cubic shape, and I'll talk some more about that here in a moment. He says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city does not need the uh, sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is its lamp, and the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. What does that mean? It means that some people, during the time that things get really difficult, there will be people, whether they're part of the nation or part of the leadership, the citizens of the kingdom will be equal when they get there and their splendor will come into the city. It doesn't mean that kings outside will come in and out of the city. It means that there will be people there in the city that bring their splendor into to it. And on that day, there will the gates will never be shut. There will... Uh, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So, man, this place is incredible. It's laid out like a cube, man. And, and the symbology and all of this, this precious stone, all of this transparency, like just, just kind of get what John is trying to do is he's trying to end describe with language that is in a, a, unable to describe what he's seeing. He's trying to describe the divine, and he's using the best thing that he knows at the time. And, and, and so we look at him, he, he's, he's like, the, the language he has just won't get it done. So he's doing the best that he can to describe the indescribable. And he says that everybody who's a part of it are people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I can't make up my mind where I want to get into this now or later. We'll wait till later. It says, then he showed me, the, the angel showed me, he said, just five more verses. The river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. If you go back and read the Genesis creation in the Garden of Eden, it's the same thing. It's just improved. 
And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing the twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree for the, are, are for the healing of the nations. That word healing there doesn't mean that we'll get sick in heaven. It is the, it, it's the word we get our word therapy from. It's just, it's just good, man. It just, it just keeps things better, keeps them healthy. No longer will there be any, uh, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him, and they will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Well, just kind of talking about this. <laughs> when you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you will find that it has this incredible harmony. It just keeps telling the same story in different unique ways. When God told them to build the tabernacle or the temple, he gave them specific designs for it. And we know it had the outer court, and, the, and then it had the court of the Gentiles, the court of women, the court of Jewish men, the court of priests. And we get all the way to the inside, then it has the court, or it has the holy place. And then inside the holy place is the most holy place, or the holy of holies. And it's laid out like a cube. And only the high priest could go in there once a year. It was such a serious deal. And, and you could read about it in the book of Leviticus. And, and, and God said to them, when the high priest comes in there to make atonement for the sins of the people, what he is to do is he is to take a ceremonial bath and clean himself. Then he is to put on the ceremonial undergarments. And then after he gets on the ceremonial undergarments, he's to put on the ceremonial outer garments. And then he's to put on the breastplate of righteousness, which is made like a cube and has all these different colored stones, each one with the name of the tribes of Israel written on it. And then he is to take and put on his turban. And on his turban is to be written the name of God. Then he comes into the holy place with incense burning and, and bells on his feet to symbolize that he knows he's coming into the most holy place where God dwells. And he sprinkles blood from the sacrifice on the altar and he makes the offering to atone for the sins of the people. And then he leaves and it is a terrifying thing for him to do. And all of this symbology, all of these steps that he had to take was to remind him he had no business being in the presence of God. It was by God's grace that God was allowing him to come in there, and he was coming in there on behalf of the people. But when we get to the city, man, the city is the most holy place. It is where we dwell. And so that is the picture that is being given here. The city of God is designed to radiate both here and now and then and there. That's why it's described in all of this transparency. It is the glory of God impacting human souls and now that are reunited with physical bodies and the glory of God is hitting them and it is reflecting, refracting and hitting all of the rest of the creation in the new heaven and the new earth and the glory of God is just lighting up everything. It's just emanating from this place. And so how should we live here and now and and what we, should we expect then and there? And he's given us a great vision of it. Okay, we, we don't know exactly how every single piece of this will play out, but we do know that we are designed in the here and now to radiate the glory of God. That's why we say that the perfect will of God, according to Romans chapter 12, is to um, have the renewal of our minds. See, you're going to go again, set my mind on things above and be transformed by the word. This is your reasonable uh, act of worship. This is sacrificial worship. This is the will of God. This is what the perfect will of God is. Because when we walk in that way, when we're focused on heaven and not on earth, and we're thinking about who Jesus is, then all of a sudden God starts to get glory from our lives because we're no longer thinking about ourselves. We're thinking about him. And so then he pours glory out on us. 
And so we start experiencing the blessing, blessing of heaven coming to earth, and that is our purpose as citizens of the city of God in preparation for eternity, is that in the here and now, we radiate the glory of God, and God's glory is just being bounced off of us, not because we are good people, not because we are righteous people in the sense of we do good and other people do bad, but we have the righteousness of Christ, and our names are written in the Lamb book of life, and as we walk in obedience to honor our king, then glory comes into our lives and we reflect, reflect the glory of God everywhere. Well, there's coming a day in the future, according to this text, where our physic, like we are doing that spiritually right now. That's what's happening. Like even, even in the midst of like I'm, I'm, I'm preaching the truth of the word of God and the glory of God falls, we hope, and the, the anointing falls even on, on my ability to communicate the truth that God has called me to communicate and you receive it and, and you're, you know, we, we amen. Why do we amen? It's like, man, I agree with what you're saying and the glory of God starts bouncing around and we get encouraged and then we go out during the week and we try to live and walk through all the frustrations that we might experience, keeping our minds and our, our eyes fixed spiritually on the things above. But there's coming a time where God will make all things new, and this will not just be a spiritual experience anymore, but bodies throughout time who have been believers in Christ will be re resurrected from the dead to be reunited with the soul, and the, the new Jerusalem will come down to the new creation, and that's a picture of the city of God, and God will reflect his glory among all of the people he knows as his children. And so what can we expect? Well, one, we can expect a new place to live. It's a new heaven and a new earth. As God will renew our bodies, he will renew the earth. And I, like our bodies, I think it will be the same but different. Like you will... You will recognize each other in heaven. You will recognize and retain your personality, but it no longer will be fallen, and you will have a resurrected, glorified body like Jesus had, and the two will be reunited. You won't be like a spiritual, ghostly figure floating around. You will be a being, a, a human being. That's what you are. That's what you always will be. You won't become an angel. You're not going to grow some wings. You're going to get a glorified body like Jesus's, and you're going to have a new place to live, and it'll be a perfect earth that has not succumbed to the fall. And so, like, when we look at this, we, we love this place. I love this place. I love the earth. What is it? Look around at creation, man. You go out to some of the places out west and you get in the Rockies. Man, one of my favorite places to visit is Montana, man. I just love that place. And you get there and you're like, look at the, look at the beauty of the creation that God has, has given us. And you go to the um, redwood forest and you see those. You get out on the ocean, man. You pull a fish out of the ocean and you're like, huh, look at the colors of that thing. It's all fallen, but God created it, and he's going to create it all new. And so, like, we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth that we live in that will be improved over this one. And so we go, man, the earth seems like it's falling apart. It is, and it will, and we should try to do everything that we can to be good stewards of what he's given us, but it clearly says in the Bible that, man, this thing is going down. But a new one's coming up. <laughs> That's good news. And so we can't save this one, but he will recreate a new one. And here's the second thing we can expect. Perfect worship. It says that, I heard the voice saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. There's no church. There's no I got to get up early on Sunday morning. It doesn't exist. There's no temple. It's just worship. And so God will dwell among us. In the garden, God dwelled among them. They had freedom to go and do other things, and God would come and he would say, hey, what's going on? They were just in the presence of God until they weren't when they fell and tried to hide from him. You see, there is a void in us that only God himself can fulfill. 
I love what C.S. Lewis says. He says, I find in myself a desire in which this world cannot fulfill. I have determined that I must be made for another world. And we are. See, it doesn't matter, man. It doesn't matter. That's why you can paint the whole inside of your house. If you haven't figured out by the way, I'm painting my house right now, okay? (laughs) But you can paint that thing, man, and you can put a fresh coat of paint on it and change the whole thing to something new, and then the trend will change. And you'll need to paint it again because it keeps wearing out. And you can, you can get a new car, and, and man, you can just be like, for so long, it just feels so good. And then all of a sudden, it's like, this thing, I need a new car. I mean, look at it. It's almost got 100,000 miles on it. That's what we use. We need to go buy a new one. Something deeper is going on there. What's going on is that, that it, even for a believer, man, like you, you find that the only thing that can satisfy you is Jesus, and but physically you're still lacking because spiritually he can satisfy, but physically you're still lacking. But at this point in the nature of God, our very desire fulfilled. Just, just like all of a sudden, man, that feeling that you get when you experience something new and you're like, this is awesome. It never goes away. Just, this is awesome. And I see you and you, how you doing? That's awesome. How are you doing? Awesome. <laughs> and we're just all like in this place of it's awesome. And we're, we're walking through in this perfect place of worship because the glory of God is reflecting off of us. And it's all about God. And we're all about God because it's, it's a marriage, man. We are becoming one. We become one with him spiritually when he transforms our spirits. But in the resurrection at the end of time, we will become one with him physically. And that's why we have the Holy of Holies described here. We are in the presence of God. We are experiencing um, our very desire fulfilled, and we can expect emotional elation, kind of a leading into how you're doing. He says, man, I, I shall, he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no longer any death, no longer any mourning or crying or pain for the first things have passed away. I mean, don't you love it when you have days where you feel great? Sometimes you wake up and you're like, I'm going to do this, man. And you just like, you feel like you can conquer the world. You're in the zone. Emotionally, you feel great. You come out and guys, man, you, it's one of those days where you just like, you kiss your wife and you tell her you're, you love her. And the wives are going, man, when do those days happen, right? <laughs> But you, you do, you feel that way sometime, and, 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 and you don't have to have your coffee before you feel like you can smile. You just wake up and you just feel good. You know, a lot of days you wake up and you just want to kick the dog, <laughs> right? Not one of those days, but one of these days where you just feel good. You see, emotionally, you're elated. Things are all right. That's a picture of what the city of God is like in the future, man. And so when I get frustrated here, I have to be reminded sometimes, man, I, I'm a citizen of the city of God, and even though I'm going through this difficult time right now, I have a promise. And as sure as I know the Lord Jesus Christ has come the first time, he's coming the second time. And he's told me how he would come. And he said, fix your eyes on this, because until I get back, man, things are going to frustrate you. All this stuff about, well, you have not, because you asked, like if, if you, if there's a certain teaching out there that says, man, if you don't have everything you need, it's because you don't have enough faith. That's baloney. Like, we're going to, as a matter of fact, the Bible teaches that, that we are never more like Christ than when we share in his sufferings. It's because sometimes the suffering puts us in a place where all we have to hope for is eternity. And so we're actually being obedient to do what God called us to do, to fix our eyes on things above. Man, you, you could be frustrated about all the things in your, your home and trying to make improvements and getting them right and everything and, and trying to fix things and, and keep it clean and organized. And that could be the passion of your life, and you could get really frustrated if that, that is not the case. But as soon as your spouse is diagnosed with cancer. You don't care about any of that. You don't care how, how dirty the house is. You don't care about any of that. Oh, you, you start to think about things that really matter. You start to fix your eyes on things above because you know, man, like our lives are about to tr- shift dramatically. And that's why the Lord has given us the book of Revelation is to keep us focused on the things that really matter. And then we see we can expect new experiences. I've kind of alluded through this to this throughout um, 
um, the application portion, but it says that he's making all things new. <laughs> and so God will make all things new. The earth, creation, pleasures. You all hear me talk about Red Dog, man. Red Dog, he sees the world through his nose. Like his eyes, like his eyelids half the time, if he's not looking up like this, they're just covering his eyes anyway. But he comes in and he sniffs the counter. And he goes over and sniffs the trash can. Then he sniffs all the people. And he's just look, he's just seeing the world. But he can't see in color. I can see in color. He sees in, I don't know what color he sees in. Never ask him, but I know it's not what I see. What if in heaven, the Lord, like in that twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed and boom, all of a sudden, all these new scent receptors. And I can smell like red dog. What is that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and and then what, if, what if there's a whole nother spectrum of color? Just all of a sudden, wow. I th- I mean, think of some of the most incredible experiences that we experience um, on this side of eternity. They would be new on the other side. New ones. Who created all those? See, we, we, the, the, we've been duped by the devil into thinking that, man, when you die, I guess you just go up there. <laughs> when, when I die, what's that song, when I die, I want to come back as a country boy? Lord, if my neck ain't red, just leave me dead. That's bad theology. <laughs> That's bad theology. And so like, 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 we have to know, man, that there are experiences that God has created for us to enjoy on this side, and those, there will be new experiences on the other side. We can expect perfect redemption. And he said to me, it is done on the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost, that he who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. It's it's free for the one who thirsts for it. Jesus said, blessed are those who thirst, so they shall be, the thirst shall be quenched. Blessed are the hungry, for they shall be filled. He says, that's what Christ came for is to redeem us in all of our splendor. You say, why would God do that? I don't know. But the question, like, it's just it's in his nature, man. It's just, he's just showing us who he is. The thing that's more confounding to me, though, than why would God do that is why would a human reject that? Why would... Why would a human reject that? It's so, like, the Lord is so good. And, and he desires to be in intimacy with us. And it is the city of Babylon that gets us to think something different. But the city of God is amazing. And, and, and the Lord just over and over is calling out to us. And redemption, you see, and the point I've been trying to make, is not complete until time is no more. And so when I meet the Lord, I'm redeemed spiritually, but I'm not redeemed physically. And the city of God is a real place. And if you know Christ, you can expect to live there spiritually today, and you can expect to live there physically when the, when the Lord says, this is it. It's over. And so the big idea of today's talk is time is all about eternity. That's what your life is all about. You don't become an eternal being. The moment you're born, you are one. There's no such thing as annihilation. According to the scriptures and what it means to be a Christian, there are citizens of the city of Babylon and there are citizens of the city of God. And as soon as a a new soul is formed and created, it's eternal. The number of days that it lives physically before Christ returns are fixed. 
but spiritually, it is eternal. It never ages. That's why you, <laughs> that's why like, I just look at side and I say, man, I feel just like I did when I was 25. And I look in the mirror and I go, what is wrong? And my soul doesn't age. My body ages. My mind ages. But my soul, man, is without age because it is eternal. And so time as I'm living out is about my soul living in flesh, becoming for eternity what I will always be. And taking this choice that God has given me in his sovereignty and deciding, am I among the cowardly and unbelieving or am I one who boldly proclaims that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world? He has forgiven me of my sins and he has transformed me into a new creation. The city of God is a city of transformation. And I transformed here and now and I'll be transformed physically then and there. <laughs> and so when you, <laughs> when you come outside and the tire's flat, you can get really mad and drop a four-letter word, or you can take a step back and go, I'm a citizen of the city of God. And that's never going to happen in the future. And you get the air compressor out and just get that thing fixed. When you find out things don't work out at work like you wish they would have, you can get really upset and anxious and have a panic attack. Or you can step back and go, wait a minute here. Like, I'm not even going to work at this place in another 50 years. I don't even know how much time I have, but I know I'm a citizen of the city of God. And it's okay. Like, so... Like, whatever's going on, you can always fix your mind on the things above, and it will carry you through the difficult things that the city of Babylon will use to try to get you to turn your back on God and rebel. And just, the Lord says, it's man, they fix your eyes on this, and it will help you on all of that. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your truth. The book of Revelation, how it speaks to us, it gives us hope. And Lord, whatever we're, we may be facing, and I know there are folks here today, Lord, are facing all kinds of different things that I know nothing about. I pray that you would burn this truth into their soul, Lord, and they'd be able to keep their eyes fixed on your truth. If there's someone here, Lord, who doesn't know you and has never responded to the invitation to acknowledge Jesus, that you are God in the flesh who died for our sins, may today be the day of their spiritual transformation, and may they lay down their lives and say yes to you. And I pray that you would help them to have the courage to do that. And I thank you, Lord, for this body of believers that you're raising up in this community, that, Lord, you're giving us an opportunity to show our community, to show this city what the city of transformation looks like. And we pray that you would establish us in such a way that people are set free and they begin to live and they begin to experience your joy on a level that they didn't know was possible. We love you, we thank you, and we pray these things in the name of Christ. And amen. I'm going to turn the service over to Sean here in a second, but do want to encourage you. Like, if man, you may be like, man, I, I got questions. I, 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 I don't know if I'm a citizen of the city, and I want to know. Man, we put this little thing in your bulletin. It's called a connection card. And just fill it out and say, I want to talk to somebody. There's a plate at the back. You can throw it in on the way out, or you can hand it to me um, or one of the staff. We'd love to visit with you about that, love to pray with you. Maybe you do make a decision during this time of uh, worship. You go, hey, I want you to know I, I, laid some, I nailed some things down. We, we'd love to know that too. Uh, but anything you need, man, we're here for you, and we want to help you. And just know, man, like God... <laughs> 
If you'll do what I just taught you, this week will look a lot different if you've never done it before. You walk out what I just taught you today, and your week will be like a week you've never lived before. And, and, and you'll see, man, the Lord showing up in ways you're like, wow. And so I encourage you to do that. Sean, lead us in a final song.